ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to a new series on the most illustrious channel, The Flaky Biscuit. I haven't really had a chance to mention it yet, but I am a massive Tolkien nerd, and The Silmarillion is a very near and dear to my heart. It is a beautiful piece of literature which tells the story of the creation of Middle-earth and the great wars that happened long, long before the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. However, it is quite a dense book written in a very archaic style, and that can be a bit daunting to Lord of the Rings fans who just want to learn more about the history of Middle-earth. My sister, for instance, is a huge fan of the books, and she really wanted to read The Silmarillion, but she uh, couldn't get past the first page. If you have been in a similar situation where you attempted to read this book and couldn't, then you're in luck, because what I am offering to you today is the first episode in a new series which will be an abridged version of The Silmarillion. I will cover every part of the book, giving you the rundown on all the important events, along with visual aids and my own brand of, uh, personality. These videos are a little more difficult for me to make, so I will only be releasing about one a month for the foreseeable future, covering about uh, two chapters per video. So if you are at all interested in The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy The Silmarillion Abridged. And Professor Tolkien, I'm sorry. <laughs> In the beginning, there was Eru Iluvatar, who is essentially the god of this world. He created the Ainur, who are basically angels, and he taught them to sing for him. At first, they sang by themselves, but soon Iluvatar taught them to sing together in harmony. Everything was great, but then Melkor, that jerk, decided he wanted to sing his own song, so he starts diverging from the melody and causing all kinds of problems. So Iluvatar stands up, and at first he's chill with it. He's like, that was cute, but let's get back on track now. So he starts a new song, and the Ainur try to sing it, but Melkor just keeps on, and it sounds absolutely awful. Luvatar stands up again, and he's a little more serious now, and he's like, hey, it was fine once, but knock it off. So they start a third song, but once again, Melkor just doesn't quit, and he keeps on blaring his own obnoxious music, and it all sounds terrible. At last, Luvatar stands up one last time, and now he's ticked. So he makes everyone just shut up completely, and then he says, nice try, Melkor, but in the end, everything comes from me and goes back to me, so even if you want to try to screw it up, you can't. So the Ainur are a little freaked out, but Melkor is just salty, because you know how we be. Then Iluvatar takes the Ainur out of their halls, or wherever they are, I, I don't know, and he shows them a vision of the Earth, which the Ainur have all been creating through their music. He shows them what's going to happen on Earth, and how the children of Iluvatar, elves and men, will eventually come forth and live there. So some of the Ainur are like, that's so cool, we want to go there and make all that happen. Melkor felt the same way, and at first he's like, yeah, I totally want to go there and make things awesome for the children of Iluvatar, but really he just wants power, because you know how he be. So eventually the vision vanishes, and the Ainur are all sad. But Luvatar's like, it's okay guys, I just made it real. So he gives life to Ea, as the planet is called, and he sends forth some of his Ainur into the world, and they were called the Valar, which means powers of the world. The Valar get to Ea, and at first they're surprised, because all that stuff they saw in the vision hasn't been made yet. But then they realize, oh, it's our job to make all that stuff. And they get to work building and shaping the world into their vision. But Melkor, being the rotten party crusher that he is, does his best to ruin everything they try to do. And he's like, you are all of you beneath me, this is my world! But Manwe, the most powerful of the Valar, and Melkor's brother, is like, no. So he summons a bunch of Maiar, who are lesser Ainur, to come help the Valar fight Melkor off. They succeed for a little while, and the Valar begin to take on more human appearances, as they wished. But Melkor was still not fully deterred, so he just keeps coming back and trying to ruin all their work. He makes it really hard, but the Valar and Maiar keep working at it, and eventually the world, also known as the Kingdom of Arda, is made. The main purpose of this section is to introduce you to and familiarize you with the Valar and some of the Maiar, so I will do my best to abridge it because it's important. The lords of the Valar, in order of power, are Manwe, Olmo, Aule, Orome, Mandos, Lorien, and Tolkis, and the ladies are Varda, Yavanna, Niana, Este, Vare, Vana, and Nessa. Manwe Sulimo is king of the Valar, and he loves the wind and the air, and also all swift birds like the eagles. He's called Sulimo because it means Lord of the Breath of Arda. Or is it the breath of the wild? His queen is Varda, the Lady of the Stars. She and Manwe are almost always together, and when they are together, they can see and hear everything. The elves revere Varda most of all the Valar, and they call her Elbereth, a name you may or may not remember if you've read The Lord of the Rings. Olmo is the Lord of Waters, and he doesn't have a wife. 
He spends all his time floating around in the ocean and doesn't usually hang out with the other Valar in Valinor, although he is close friends with Manwe. He keeps special watch over Middle-earth, and continued to help them out even later when the elves royally screwed up and all the Valar were mad at them. He's in all the streams and the rivers, so he knows about pretty much everything that's going on in Middle-earth, even more than Manwe does. Alay is a master craftsman, and he has great love for the things of the earth. He is the most like Melkor in that they both have a very strong desire to create, but unlike Melkor, Alay cares more about the process than the result, and he's also very generous. He is an envious, and he always follows Iluvatar's will. His wife is Yavanna, called the Giver of Fruits, and while her husband loves the earth, she loves all the plants and trees growing out of it. Mandos is the keeper of the Houses of the Dead. He never forgets anything, and he knows almost everything that is to come. Vere is his wife, and she weaves everything that has happened into webs and hangs them in the halls of Mandos. Lorien is Mandos's brother, and he is a gardener, the master of visions and dreams. His wife is Este, and she is a healer. Lorien and Este's fountains give nourishment to everyone in Valinor, and the Valar often visit them to find rest. Nienna is the sister of Mandos and Lorien, and she spends most of her time in grief, mourning the wounds Melkor has given the earth. She is often in the halls of Mandos, and she provides comfort to those there, because she teaches endurance and wisdom. Tolkis is the physically strongest, so to speak, of the Valar. He loves to run and wrestle and laugh and have a good time. He's not the smartest of the Valar, but he's a good friend. His wife is Nessa, and she similarly loves to run and dance. Orome is a mighty hunter, often visiting Middle-earth from Valinor and riding his horse across the open fields. He loves horses and dogs and blows a thunderous horn. His wife is Vanna, Yavanna's younger sister, who makes the birds sing and flowers bloom every time she goes by. Only a few of the Maiar are especially important. Ase and Uinin are husband and wife and vassals of Ulmo, and they possess some power over the oceans. Ase is rather violent and loves to stir up wild storms, but Uinin helps to rein him in, so she is more beloved by mariners. For a time, Ase actually served Melkor, but Uinin helps set him straight and bring him back to Ulmo. Melian is also a Maya, and she'll be more important later, but the wisest of the Maiar, and the one you are probably most familiar with, is Olorin. He was a student of Nienna, learning from her pity and patience, and although he is not a large part of the Silmarillion, you will know him later as Gandalf. Then of course we must speak of the enemies of the Valar and the Maiar, the chief of which is Melkor, or Morgoth, as he will later be called. He was originally one of the Valar, being equal in power to his brother Manwe, and as much as the Ainur can have brothers. I really don't know how that works. But because of his greed and malice, he fell and was no longer considered one of them. He desired light, but when he couldn't have it, he turned to darkness, and thus corrupted it. Get used to his ugly mug, because you will be seeing lots of him in the future. Last and definitely least, we mentioned Sauron. He was originally a Maya of Aule, learning from him craftsmanship, but like several other Maiar, he was seduced by how powerful Melkor was. In all of the terrible things that Melkor did, Sauron had at least some small part. If I may quote the book directly, he was only less evil than his master, and that for long he served another, and not himself. 